What's up everyone, we're back. Dr. Maxfield, <laughs> Dr. Shaw, and welcome back to our channel, Dr. Lee, where we talk about all things skincare and dermatology. Today, um, so every time we do a video, it seems that we just can't get all the information in one video, which makes sense, um, but we get so many questions every time we post a video about acne, and so today we're gonna answer some of the most frequently asked questions on acne. Yeah, and it's amazing that we can't fit everything into the videos because I feel like they're really long sometimes. And I feel like they're getting longer and longer. <laughs> like, like we started out like making videos that were like 10 minutes, 12 minutes, and now they're like 30. We made a video 40 minutes on how to become a dermatologist. That was too long. That was too long. And the funny thing is in the back end too, I think, I don't know what we're doing wrong, but the videos are getting longer and longer to cut. Like that one was like two and a half hours of footage. Not hour that much, but it was something crazy. Right, I think we yeah, were filming much longer. The videos are ending up much longer. So we need to like cut this down, try to get the facts out quickly for you. <laughs> Answering your frequently asked acne questions. Here we go. Here we go. All right, first commonly asked question that we get is, are the actives in your acne cleansers actually beneficial or are you just washing these off? Right, and that's exactly it. So, I mean, it's the same ingredient in your cleanser as it is in your leave-on sometimes. And, but that's the whole crux of it. Is, is it staying in contact with your skin long enough for it to be absorbed? That's the question, right? And the, that's why the tip I give to people using these acne-based cleansers, so if you have salicylic acid in your cleanser or you have niacinamide in your cleanser or you have benzoyl peroxide in your cleanser, how do you use these? So I always say leave them on for at least five minutes just so all those actives can really sit on the skin. They can try to penetrate that very top layer of the skin called the stratum corneum and really start having their effect. Now, these are really beneficial ingredients for antibacterial purposes. So for example, the benzoyl peroxide really helps to get rid of that acne causing bacteria and just short contact with it is going to be very effective. Yeah, absolutely. And the nice thing about benzoyl peroxide is a wash as opposed to like a cream or another uh, way to use this is you rinse it off, you get the an antibacterial component, it primes your skin for actives, plus you rinse it off so it won't stain other things that may come in contact with it throughout the day. Yeah, so you didn't even believe that it stained things last time we talked about no, it. No, I know it stained things. I just don't believe it stains your face, it your hair. It stains the hair. I will dye your hair blonde. I'm telling you, your eyebrows will be blonde. Okay, no, no, this is what we're gonna do. I am going to, okay, Dr. Maxwell original investigation, I'm gonna actually just put this on my hair. I'm gonna use benzoyl peroxide for like a month straight just as a leave-on and put it on my hair and let's see what happens. Frosted tips. I promise your hair is gonna turn orange. <laughs> we'll find out, we'll find out. So yes, I think that these are very beneficial. And the nice thing about them is that if you're concerned about layering products, for example, saying your benzoyl peroxide interacts with your tretinoin or whatever you're worried about, having it as a wash off product gives the additional benefit of not having to worry about the interactions between these two things. So it won't stain your clothing, but also won't interact with your other skincare products. So I really like cleansers that have actives in them, just use them for at least five minutes. See, and that's a good point. So I guess let's, let's drop here. What are some good ingredients for acne cleansers? Ones that would work just as well as a rinse off as they would a leave on. I don't know about just as well. I mean, I don't know if they've compared like a cleanser to like a leave on benzoyl peroxide, but I would say that benzoyl peroxide and salicylic acid and sulfur would be three ingredients that I would, I would like to see in an acne cleanser. I'm really struggling to find some other ones that would also be good in cleanser and not necessarily a leave on, but I think those would be the three staples and definitely sulfur. Like I would not personally want to walk around with just a lot of sulfur on my skin, not because of what it would do, but just because it does have an odor. Right, it's actually sulfur bar soaps, um, you can find them on Amazon, highly effective for acne and rosacea, something to seriously consider. And I think we promised a sulfur video that we haven't done. Yeah, that's, uh, if you haven't noticed, we make a lot of promises <laughs> and we have every intention of keeping them. It's just so much time to put these together. So King of, of overpromise, <laughs> under deliver. <laughs> <laughs> no. Anyway, I think cleansers, that's how I would use them. The next common question is, can I mix X with Y or can I use benzoyl peroxide with retinol? Can I use salicylic acid with retinol? So let's kind of take these apart one by one. First thing is benzoyl peroxide and a retinoid. We get this question every day and for good reason. It's because benzoyl peroxide has historically oxidized and therefore inactivated retinoids, uh, retinols and older tretinoin in particular. Now, the nice thing is that nowadays you can actually use most of your tretinoin products or other prescription retinoids and retinols with benzoyl peroxide without a problem because the new formulations, the retinoids are a lot more stable and resistant to this oxidation. 
Right, so then the question is, how do you know if your particular retinol or tretinoin is safe with benzyl peroxide? And a lot of times you won't know. The newer formulations, ones that are in aqueous solutions, they've done studies on the micronized forms of tretinoin, altrino, which is a tretinoin lotion, has been shown to be safe. Adapalene or differin, or the La Roche-Posay adapalene, those are certainly safe with benzyl peroxide because we actually have a product called Epiduo, which is a combination of benzyl peroxide and adapalene in the same product, and so those are definitely definitely safe together. Now your over-the-counter benzyl peroxide and your over-the-counter retinol, those may cancel each other out. And so I would not use those together at the same time as leave-on products, but I would feel comfortable having benzyl peroxide as a wash off and then the retinol as a leave-on. I think that's a super useful tip because I think a lot of people get confused when they have both of those ingredients in their routine and they're like, oh, how do I like distance these out in space and time to make sure that they're not coming in contact with each other. And it's pretty simple. Just use the BPO benzoyl peroxide as a rinse off, rinse your face, and then you can use the retinol. And then the other thing that you could do is if you are concerned about interactions between two ingredients is using one ingredient at night and then using the other ingredient in the morning or um, using them on different days. Yeah, and I'm only gonna caveat this once because I don't wanna say it for every single combination we ended up talking about, but if two ingredients are irritating, like benzoyl peroxide and retinoids, then if you're getting irritation, then you cannot use them together in the same routine, right? So like, that's the one time I'm gonna say it here. So listen to your skin, because it, it, like this is not gonna be advice that's gonna apply to everybody, because you may have really sensitive skin and using benzoyl peroxide with adapalene is too much for your skin, or using salicylic acid with the retinol is too much for your skin. But um, we're just talking in general, do these ingredients actually interact with each other and can you use them together? So now talking about salicylic acid and retinol, do these interact? Now we don't have nearly as many studies showing an interaction between salicylic acid and retinol. We do know that both of these can be irritating ingredients. So if you use a leave-on salicylic acid product with a leave-on retinol product, those two together can increase irritation. There are some skincare products that have both of these together in the same product. And so I assume that those, those companies have done stability testing on these, but now that the newer forms of tretinoin and the newer forms of retinol are much more stable than the older forms, they're probably okay to leave together, but I usually don't recommend using them on the same at the same time on the same night. Another ingredient that's kind of making its way into the acne treatment scene is niacinamide. A lot more in the over-the-counter stuff, but it can be used with retinoids as well. Yeah, so that one is completely, as a matter of fact, highly recommend using these two together because they have additive functions together and a combination of retinol plus niacinamide is gonna have increased benefits in your acne. So that's an ingredient that I would certainly combine. Uh, shouldn't increase irritation and may actually increase the benefit of your retinol. And the last thing I'll say about mixing ingredients is that if you're starting a new routine and it's a great acne routine, introduce things slowly. Don't introduce your retinoid, your benzoyl peroxide and salicylic acid at exactly the same time, because if you get irritated, you have to back off something and which one do you back off of? So what I would do is introduce things slowly. Start with the adapalene for a month. Um, then after that, introduce your benzoyl peroxide wash or your benzoyl peroxide leave-on product. And then after that, after a few weeks, you can add in a salicylic acid cleanser. So just be uh, slowly introduce things. And then leaving the over-the-counter space, uh, retinoids, can you mix it with XYZ? So topical retinoids can be used with most topical antibiotics, another like common combination for acne. Uh, one exception to this is Dapsone. So if you're using topical benzoyl peroxide with topical Dapsone, it could turn your skin like yellowish, orangish. So make sure you're using those at uh, separate times. Right, and actually this is important uh, point of, like if you're using clindamycin, right? Clindamycin and benzoyl peroxide are commonly put together, but really you shouldn't be using clindamycin alone. I think that's a common acne mistake is that clindamycin is a great antibiotic, but you can quickly develop resistance to clindamycin if you use it without any other antibacterial. And so we often use clindamycin with benzoyl peroxide or clindamycin with an oral antibiotic just so that you don't develop resistance to the clindamycin. So we highly recommend clind clindamycin being combined with other actives against acne. Yeah, absolutely. All right, the next, we have this all the time. The next question is, am I purging? And what is purging, right? So purging is kind of difficult in my mind because the question is, is your acne just not controlled or is it getting worse or flaring? Or are you, is your medicine working and your acne is just kind of coming forward? That's actually a tough distinction. First, what is purging, right? So purging is basically when all of a sudden 
your acne gets worse when you start an acne regimen. And the thought process behind this is that all the acne that's basically sitting underneath the surface of the skin comes to the surface quicker because you're basically speeding up skin cell turnover or you're exfoliating and it's allowing those bumps to come to the surface. And so it does happen. I believe this happens quite frequently, especially when we start people on retinoids. I think this is like a fair point because especially with retinoids, especially systemic retinoids, you do see people flare a little bit initially uh, or you see like new lesions start to come out. But again, it's because your cells are turning over more quickly. Uh, and also it's because the acne treatments that you're using, whether it's Accutane or whether it's oral antibiotics, like really strong things, it still takes time for them to actually kick in. So there's this period where your skin cells are turning over, but your medications aren't like 100% yet. So you really have to, for whether or not your acne is getting better or getting worse um, or purging or not purging, one thing you have to do is just wait. You need to wait that two to three months, and we'll talk a little bit about this in a second, but you do need to wait a little bit of time just to make sure that your acne medications are actually working. Um, if you don't give it enough time, you won't get through that purging phase. Yeah, and I think the important distinction here is, uh, one, if you're purging, you know, don't quit on your treatments because they might actually be working despite this like little temporary flare. Uh, but two, if you do notice you're having like crazy purging, especially if you're on like a systemic retinoid and like you're getting tons of new cystic lesions, tons of inflammation, you know, let your dermatologist know. You know, we, we actually want to hear that because the goal here would actually be to calm down that inflammation while the other medications are still kicking in. Right, and that purging can be so bad when you start something like Accutane or Isotretinoin that we actually have to give you systemic steroids first in order to prevent that from getting getting horrendously worse. So um, it does happen. You just need to um, keep in mind that if it's getting really bad, let your dermatologist know. But you do need to get through that initial few months in order to see it actually have an effect. Now, the next question is, is it acne purging or is this, are you allergic or, not, or getting too much irritation from a product? I think that that may be a little bit easier to distinguish. One, acne is gonna care, uh, occur in your normal acne occurring. So if you get acne along your jawline or you get acne on your forehead, purging is gonna, you're gonna see pimples accelerate in those areas. Whereas irritation will occur like on the eyelids or they'll occur in areas where you don't normally have acne, but um, now you have redness in those areas. Yeah, I agree. I think that is a pretty, Pretty good distinction and something you can make. Right, so if you are getting irritation, that's when you wanna back off. And if you're getting purging, this is where you want to continue with your treatment <laughs> regimen. So important to distinguish between these two. All right, the next question that we get a lot is how long do you have to wait? So this is sort of a segue from the previous question. How long do you have to wait to actually see a benefit with your acne regimen or when do you need to consider switching? And so I wanna, I wanna show Dr. Maxfield this video I just came upon yesterday. Okay, so I don't know if you've seen this video of Madison raving about this face wash, but it's only $10, so I had to try it. She claims that this is what got rid of her acne. I don't know about that. I don't think it's just the face wash, but I wanna give it a shot. <laughs> I just took a shower. I still have a little makeup on, so I'm gonna try to see if this will remove it and just how it reacts with my sensitive skin. By the way, it was $10 at Walmart. Okay, so I'm gonna take a bit. I'm gonna like start rubbing it on my face. Side note, it smells so bad. Or it just smells like chemicals. Anyways, I'm gonna like scrub around and update you. <laughs> oh my god. It's actually feeling really like clean. Like I actually, I feel refreshed, which is so nice. <laughs> it definitely brought out a bit of my redness, but so far I don't mind it. I'll give it like a 7 out of 10. Alright, so what interesting about this video was that First, that Madison Beer actually did do this video that said that panoxyl or a cleanser that has benzoyl peroxide in it was something that really helped her acne. And I actually think that's great because it is an ingredient that has that level one grade A evidence. Yeah, I do. I think actually it's very important for people, especially in prominent places like that, to kind of come out and talk about things that have a lot of evidence. So I'm glad she did that. The second part of it is, so this, I guess, user's experience with it, you can rate it in terms of like your initial sensation, your initial experience, like a first date, but she really, really can't make any judgment call about how it's working for her at all. Yeah, definitely. I think you can say, I didn't really like the way it smelled. Like she mentioned that, which I think is important for people that are trying to decide whether or not they want to use a product. But 
um, 7 out of 10 in efficacy, you would need to evaluate over a longer period of time. So I would say two months minimum and then three months on the kind of high end. If you're not seeing a benefit in three months, that's when we need to like consider a new treatment um, alternatives. And that's kind of one of the frustrating things I think about acne. And actually, I think it's where we lose a lot of people when we're trying to get this treated really effectively is just it's really hard when you're looking in the mirror and you're kind of seeing things that you want to improve. Uh, it, it takes, you know, like we said, two three months before you're really going to get that maximal benefit from whatever you're using. So you have to be invested from the get go and know that it's going to take that period of time before you're going to get a huge bang for your buck. Yeah. And this is one of the things in dermatology, we've done a lot of studies on people adhering to treatment regimens. And we've found that less than half of people actually stick with the treatment regimen throughout the time period that you would need to see a benefit. So one of the biggest issues is not using the treatment plan long enough to actually see a benefit. And so you kind of have to have hope and trust in the system, which is a lot of the times in our patient encounters, really trying to build trust with the patient so they can actually follow the treatment regimen through this potential purging aspect, this dryness aspect that you may have with your tretinoin, and then get them to that goal line in three months where they're actually starting to see benefit in their skin and improve their confidence and actually start to have improved self-image. Yeah, and that's so important. This is one of the conditions we can treat so, so well. And like, I have such high expectations when I'm treating acne for people. And I'm always super, super, super excited at this point in my like early career just to watch people go through this because it changes their lives uh, at a really critical point in their lives. I can't, I can't agree more. One of the, my favorite things in, in dermatology is having a teenager come in, have treating their acne, and watching their mood improve, watching their confidence improve, and watching their overall life improve from just having an improved appearance of their skin. And so, and it's one of those things where it works. If you follow the treatment regimen, we will get you towards that goal line. And so um, I think it's definitely one of the most gratifying things to treat in dermatology. So the last thing we'll talk about is something that we're gonna need to dedicate a whole video to. We will at some point in our lives, but it is hormonal acne. So what can you use to treat your hormonal acne? So that's the question. First, what is hormonal acne? So hormonal acne commonly occurs along the jawline, in the chin, they're often cystic, they're often painful, they often occur in women, and they can flare during your menstrual cycle. Now, I always make the argument that all acne is hormonal because it's under the influence of hormones a lot of time. A common misconception, actually I'm seeing more more about this is that even though it's hormonally driven, uh, your actual hormone levels within your body are probably normal. The vast majority of people with acne with uh, with even bad acne just have normal levels of hormones, but their receptors in their cells are actually more sensitive to the otherwise normal levels. There are exceptions to this, but so when we talk about balancing these hormones and trying to offset it, we're wanting to make like, you like nuanced minor changes. And I think it's reasonable to see a doctor for this. And you wanna make sure that you have the right diagnosis because if you do have hormonal acne and you do have elevated levels of hormones or testosterone in the body, you wanna figure out what the underlying cause is. You know, I definitely don't wanna cause any fear mongering here, but right. there's, you know, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome that can cause elevated levels of hormones. You could have um, cysts on the ovary. You can have ovarian tumors that can cause this, you know, very uncommon causes, but, you know, something to consider if you're developing other signs, not just hormonal acne, but you're developing hirsutism or hair in a male distribution, you have a dark neck or have acanthosis nigricans, um, if you have, what are some other signs? If you're experiencing like weight gain, that seems like disproportionate or more than you would expect. If you are having irregular menses, whether like they're lasting too long in between breaks or they're occurring randomly or too heavy bleeding. Like these are all things that, uh, you know, your dermatologist actually takes into consideration, not only when they look at you, talk to you, but when they're also thinking about what treatments would be best for you. And that's why conversations are super important regarding hormonal acne. And people with PCOS, my wife does OBGYN. And so, you know, we've had these conversations before. People with PCOS, they really struggle with treatments. And sometimes they have difficulty establishing a good relationship with their treating provider or their dermatologist. So you really need to build trust so that you can come up with a treatment plan that's going to work for you. So some people don't want to have treatments that regulate their hormones. They don't want to be on birth control. They don't want to be on these other medications. And so you have to have this conversation. How can I get my skin better? without using medications that maybe I don't want to use, or maybe you do want to use those medications. So that's why going to a dermatologist is going to be really important for something like this, because our tools that we have to treat the hormonal acne over the counter 
uh, we would treat like any other form of, of acne. So, you know, your different, your benzyl peroxide, your salicylic acid, they're going to go after a lot of the causes of acne, but they're not going to regulate your hormones. We do have other treatments in dermatology that can regulate your hormones. Right. And so, you know, something simple like birth control is an obvious first step to kind of balance out some hormones. There are some other medications like metformin that can be used to help offset some of this and then some other stronger ones. Now, Spironolactone is a medication that I think is an excellent choice. Lots of studies behind this old blood pressure medication at lower doses to help just mildly decrease the androgen or uh, kind of those like masculinating hormones that can contribute to acne. Yeah. And so we use uh, spironolactone quite frequently with a lot of success in people that have hormonal forms of acne. Uh, some people benefit uh, when they have hormonal forms of hair loss as well with spironolactone. Now, this is uh, something you can't use in pregnancy. This is something that can't be used in males, but um, in women can be very, very effective in the treatment of acne. The other option that you have is topical treatments, topical spironolactone, which is only available as a prescription, but companies like Apostrophe are, are companies that do offer a topical spironolactone that does have data on it to show that it is effective for hormonal acne. And then uh, hitting the market soon, is something called Win Levy, and I think we mentioned it in our live Q and A. But it's a medication that does um, block the um, the androgen receptor and is going to be very effective in the treatment of acne, of hormonal acne, when it comes out. Yeah, and I can't wait to see more from this because this topical, like mild anti-androgen, it's it's actually a game changer in my mind. This is like a very new and novel mechanism to enter the space where there's actually no counterpart, no dupe, no other option available. It's gonna be great. Well, we'll see what happens when we get it in our hands because a lot of things in theory sound <laughs> great and then you get it in your hands, you're like, oh, this didn't work at all. So we'll kind of reserve judgment until I get. That's I'm the excited. advantage. I'm excited about it. This is one of the few things I'm very excited about because I'm probably gonna use it on my head. <laughs> I'll talk about that later, but um, the, the advantage of us um, seeing patients, right? I think on, uh, you know, if we see, you know, hundreds of patients a week, we get an idea, like on paper, things sound great. You know, the research articles sound great a lot of times, and then you get something in your hands and you use it on yeah. a few patients, and then it doesn't work as well as the studies show, or it has other issues with it that make it very difficult for the patient to use. And you don't know these things until you actually get it in your hands and start using it on patients a lot of times. And so patient experience, I think, gives us a lot of value uh, when we're creating content, because we say, you know, that's isn't like, it's, it's, for example, if you say, you know, Rogaine or Minoxidil, great for hair loss, true. Um, but how often do people actually use it the way it's supposed to be used? And so you have to, we also take into account the difficulty of actually using the medication, acquiring the medication, and then how well does it actually work on the patients that we've we've used it on. It's true. I mean, even just over the course of a year, this is like thousands of conversations and interactions we're getting to have on the subject. You know, like neither one of us are struggling with acne right now. But we get to talk to people who are, you know, we get to walk alongside them and like hear from them what are their struggles. And then all of that we take into consideration plus the data and put together like these conversations. A lot of things we love to talk about and acne is one of them. So thank you all so much for tuning in. These are some frequently asked acne questions. So hopefully we answered one of your questions. Uh, but if you have more questions, leave them below. We can always do a follow up video on acne, um, letting you know some of our experiences and some of the things that are commonly asked because we can never seem to get it in one video. So thank you all so much for tuning in. <laughs> yeah, we always appreciate you so much. So thank you. All right, we'll see you next time. So today, frequently asked questions on acne that we get all the time. Hopefully these questions will answer, these answers will answer some of your questions that you've had. <laughs> yeah, all right. Answering, answering frequently asked acne, answering frequently asked acne. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine. And you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. It's a tongue twister, all right. And there's that plane. A lot of planes today. Just so many options. Damn. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah, you'll be fine. Okay. Got these jets. Um.